Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 10, Chapter 13. <coughs> Sri Shuka said, O fortunate and best of devotees, you have raised excellent inquiries. Your eagerness to hear repeatedly augments your relish and the novelty. The worthy, who life's essence apprehend, who know the purpose and ultimate end, at every moment joyfully adhere the exploits of Lord Atuta to hear, which seems to them as ever fresh and new as gallant youths a fair damsel pursue. O King, <coughs> attentive, hear what I shall say the confidential truth that I convey. To pupils who love their preceptor well, the preceptor great mysteries can tell. Thus, having saved from death the mighty Lord, emerged with all the boys and calves restored. Then down to the fine river bank he led, and the illustrious one to them said, O friends, how fair the river bank delights, the soft and cooling sand our sport invites. Mark how the water blooms sway in the breeze, whose sweet fragrance intoxicates the bees, who hover round the shrubs, while in the trees the feathered choristers warble around, surcharging all the place with charming sound. In this place, where the beauty is enhanced, and since the day is very much advanced, let us dine, and our hunger satisfy, and let the cattle chew the grass nearby. To this proposal all the boys agreed, secured the calves, and let them drink and feed. Then opening their bags of food, each boy dined with the Almighty One, full of joy. Thus sitting in concentric circles round, all the cowherd boys there Krishna surround. Their eager eye, their eager gazes, as flowers unfurl like leaves and petals round the lotus whirl. Some use petals and leaflets for their plates. Some place on the clean rock their dainty cates, and some their open packages outspread, others with soft tree bark were contented. They showed each other's viands to compare the tastes of their respective dainty fare. Laughing and making laugh, their joy increased, as with the Almighty they took their feast. A flute tucked in his sash, a bugle and cane, hanging upon his left-hand side remain, and in his hand some dainty curds and cream, with soft and sweet juicy fruits in between his fingers, thus seated there with his friends, the merry banquet with laughter commends. While the dwellers of heaven from the skies looked on with wonderment and vast surprise, how the one who grand sacrifice consumes his playful exploits of childhood assumes. Thus, O Bharat, while all dined with good cheer, the boys, for whom a tutor is most dear, while deeper absorbed in merriment, knew not the calves greedy for grass had left that spot. On noting this, they were disquieted. Then Krishna, who to fear himself is dread, <clears throat> continue eating, O oh my friends, said he, I shall with the cars return presently. Thus he, and then proceeded on his way. The hills, bowers, shrubs, and caves to survey. As the almighty Krishna searched the wood, he still held in his hand pieces of food. 
The one born of the lotus was amazed. At Agasura's salvation was dazed. He came down from his realm above the sky to test his glory and his own to try. Himself he did unwitting implicate as he the boys and calves did confiscate in order to observe wonders divine, perpetuator of the Kudu line, and thus resorting to his mystic power, the boys and calves hid in a secret bower. Failing to find the calves, as on he paced, back to the river bank his way retraced. But when he saw the boys were gone from there, Krishna, his search, continued fraught with care. After searching all of the forest round, when neither the boys nor the calves were found, suddenly omniscient in his view, Krishna, the act of the Creator, knew. Thus Krishna, to afford the mother's joy, assumed the form of each calf and each boy, and did Ka's desire facilitate, since he did first the universe create. Thus each calf and each cowherd boy complete, in exact form from the head to the feet, each their wonted accoutrements adorn as cane, flute, reeds, food bag, and bugle horn. The ornaments and the habiliment, the quality, the deeds, and temperament, and each voice in exact similitude, since everything with Vishnu is endued. Thus mighty Krishna, who is never born, immutable, assumed each several form. Now Krishna himself with himself proceeds, as all the cowherds, and enacts his deeds, and does himself as the calves himself tend, and thus the all soul to Braja went, and thus the all soul does to Braja wend. Thus himself, as the calves he forward led, and brought each to its own respective shed, himself, as all the boys, O king, now comes and thus enters each their respective homes. Their mothers, when the sweet flute music heard, quickly arose, by fond affection stirred, and held them tightly in their loving arms, enamoured by their most delightful charms. Their sublime maternal love was expressed, and suckled them with the milk from their breast. And thus Krishna was fully delighted, and the mothers the supreme Brahman fed. Thereafter, O king, the mothers essay, according to the routine of the day, to anoint and massage and bathe them well, to invest them with a protective spell, to deck them with tilak and ornaments, and dress them in fresh gleaming fine garments. And thus, according to the time and need, they fondly serve with rare dainty and with rare dainty's feed. Now, when the calves had entered in the stalls, the mother cows raised loud their mooing calls, and from their flowing udders fed their young, and licked them repeatedly with their tongue. The cows and the cowherd dames, as before, the fondest maternal affection bore. But now indeed their sons were Lord Hari, their fond love increased exponentially. The dwellers of the cowherd settlement for one year felt their affection augment, their love beyond all limits overruns, as ne'er before, as Krishna was their sons. Thus Krishna himself with himself proceeds, and for one year enacts these playful deeds, and from the cow pens to the pastures wends, and himself as the calves himself he tends. Once, when five or six days did yet remain, 
to complete the year, he with Rama came, and thus the supreme birthless Lord Divine entered the pasture leading forth the kine. Meantime, the mother cows, not far away, grazing upon Govardhan Hill, survey down in the valley on the mountain side, and suddenly their youngling calves espied. Now, when the cows, their youngling calves, beheld, affection, affected by affection, were compelled, and heedless of themselves, they forward pace, and scaping, left the herdsmen in that place. Although the path was rough and overgrown, into the valley the cows gallop down, as if with but one pair of legs proceed, their necks flapping and their humps raised with the speed. They with mooing and bellowing resound, and milk flows from their udders to the ground. Although the cows had new-born calves to rear, these older calves were now their anxious care. They fed them with the milk that did outpour, and licked the calves as if they would devour. The cowherds, who had been thus frustrated, were sore ashamed and infuriated, as over the rough path their way pursued, sudden the calves and their own sons they viewed, which seeing they were whelmed in the love tide of rising affection, and all their pride and frustration did suddenly subside. Their boys in their loving arms enfolded, and deep inhaled the fragrance from their head, and thus the herdsman, each with his own boy, attained the supreme and ultimate joy. The cowherds, embracing their sons, attained to true fulfilment and high perfection gained. Then, gradually and with difficulty, they cease and take their leave reluctantly. And as they go, stirred with fond memories, tears of affection stream down from their eyes. Now, when Rama saw the intensity, how the cowherd's love gained to such degree, how older calves still from their mother's drink, he was confounded and began to think, ah me. What a wonderful thing is this! The cowherds and myself's increase of bliss and love that augments beyond control for Vasudeva, soul of every soul. Whence or from whom does this influence come? Perhaps it, perhaps some sorceress or some demon. It must, my brother's power surely be, or else. How could it thus influence me? Thus he, the noble scion of the line of Dasarha, perceived with eye divine, and thus he could the boys and the calves see as diverse forms of Vaikuntha Hari. These are not the incarnate deities, and nor are those incarnated rishis. Severally and simultaneously, they are all manifestations of thee. Pray tell me why and how this has occurred. Thereon the Lord with him briefly conferred, and all was understood once he had heard. After a brief moment, the self-born one, though on earth the course of one year had run, arriving there was surprised and dismayed, for Harry still there with his comrades played. Text 48. This one is an extra verse. When great Brahma to Satyaloka hide, the wardens at his gate access denied, since Krishna by contrivance of his own sat with a four-faced form upon his throne. Back to the text. Whatever boys under my spell repose, still there remain, and therefore who are those? 
and there the calves, without nor stay nor let, graze freely, though they have not risen yet. But if the boys are here, then who are they, recumbent in my mystic spell that lay? Or how is it that they remain still here, with the Lord Vishnu sporting all this year? The self-born was confounded and confused, as contemplating distinction he mused, and thus he into discomfiture fell, the real and the unreal he could not tell. To mystify great Vishnu he essayed, but was himself bewildered and dismayed. He holds the world under his mighty spell, thus the birthless into confusion fell. As mist cannot remove darkness of night, as glowworm cannot emulate daylight, the weaker potency cannot beguile the superior, but must prove futile. Now, while the birthless one was looking on, all suddenly the boys and the calves shone, transfigured into forms of cloud-dark blue and clad in fine raiment of yellow hue. Each had four mighty arms and radiant grace, holding the conch, discus, lotus and mace adorned with shiny lofty diadems and ear pendants sparkling with rarest gems they were decked with wreaths and flower garlands the shri sign and gem studded bright armbands each had the gem fastened around the neck armlets their arms and bracelets their hands deck their lotus feet with gold anklets were dight, their fingers with gold rings glistering bright, around their waist an ornamental zone, and sacred thread over their shoulders thrown. From their feet up to the top of the head, they were with fresh tulsi engarlanded, offered by great devotees who adore, who have of piety a boundless store. Their soothing smiles shone as the soft moon sheen, their roving eyes radiate, <coughs> red dawns gleam, like rajas that creation generates, and sattva the stay that perpetuates. He saw all beings gathered in that spot, himself, those that move, and those that move not, assuming diverse forms in diverse ways, they worship, dance, and sing in song his praise. The yoga perfections were manifest, anima and mahima and the rest, and emanated potencies adore, and evolutes in number twenty-four. And there was seen the cosmic intellect, all worshipping the Lord with great respect. He saw almighty time, nature received, the rituals of sanskara perceived, desire, acts, and qualities he saw, assuming forms and worshipping with all. These forms were ever eternal and divine, exclusive bliss and consciousness sublime, whose great glory could not be touched upon by the Upanishads and their wisdom. Right suddenly the birthless one perceived the supreme Brahman as in all conceived, and saw all this as his emanation, the mobile and immobile creation, the birthless one fraught with perplexities, deprived of his eleven faculties, stood silent, dazzled by the light sublime, like a doll by a grand image divine. The Lord of Saraswati, when he saw this mighty glory, he was struck with awe, self-manifest and ungenerated, 
known when all else scripture has negated, and thus he fell into perplexity. Oh, what is this? He thought, but could not see. When birthless Krishna understood his plight, drew back the curtain and restored his sight. Now, Ka, his external sense did regain, like the dead coming back to life again. He rose and strove to open his eyes wide, and saw all this, and saw himself beside. Then suddenly he cast his looks around, and saw the Brindavan, which did abound with trees, who with their sap, flowers and wood, sustain the people in their livelihood. Where men and creatures live in amity, by nature void of animosity. Since there birthless Lord Krishna did abide, there was no hunger, thirst, anger, nor pride. As Parameshti, the grandsire, gazed, he was confounded, astonished, amazed. Brahman supreme and indivisible, uncircumscribed and inconceivable, now exhibiting his divinity, as a child from a cowherd family. Who, with the cowherds, his comrades and friends, drives to the pasture land, the calves and tens, now alone as before, searching the wood, still holding in his hand pieces of food, thus having been graced with this wondrous sight, down from his swan vehicle did the light, Prostrating himself on the ground, the god laid down his body like a golden rod. With his four crowns, while bowing low his head, those two feet touched and copious tears shed, and sprinkled them with tears of ecstasy, as twere a grand bathing ceremony. With risings up and falling down again, for long did at those feet prostrate remain recalling repeatedly what he saw of such grandeur, was filled with pious awe. Then little by little he did compose himself, and wiping his eyes, then arose with lowered head, but looking up, beheld in humility, hands together held, trembling while at Lord Mukunda he gazed, and with tremulous voice, his glory praised. <clears throat> Thus ends chapter 13 in book 10 of the great and glorious Bhagavata Purana, the text beloved of swan-like saints sung by the son of Vyasa. <clears throat>